Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. This is a very special event for Bogan Books. We have Kathy Pelletier and Kevin St. Jar with us this evening to discuss the new collection of essays titled Breaking Bread, Essays from New England on Food, Hunger, and Family. And uh, it's a very rare occasion to have both Kevin and Kathy available at the same time. And I'm exceedingly grateful to both of them. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Heidi Carter, and I am the owner and bookseller at Bogan Books. We are the northernmost bookstore in the eastern United States, located on America's First Mile on U.S. Route 1, which ends in um, Key West, Florida. And we, our view is of Canada. We're right on the Canadian border. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I'll introduce both of the authors. And then we'll get started. Kathy Pelletier is the author of 12 novels, beginning with The Funeral Makers, published in 1986. She and theoretical physicist S. James Gates Jr., a National Medal of Science recipient, co-authored Proving Einstein Right, released in 2019 by Public Affairs. Praised by Walter Isaacson, the book was awarded the Brown University Book Award for 2020. Also released in 2019, and we sold a lot of these, um, was uh, The Ragin' Cajun, a memoir she co-wrote with legendary fiddler songwriter Doug Kershaw. Her most recent book is Northeaster, a story of courage and survival in the blizzard of 1952, to be released in January 2023. Hopefully we'll have another event. And... Um, a middle grade book, Mystery Traveler at Lake Fortune and Evangeline, a prose version of the Longfellow poem, are forthcoming by Down East Books in 2023. Uh, Kathy's resume is long. She's been a very accomplished author. She's had books that have become movies. She has um, the Madagash series looked at right now, option to be a television series, I believe. Kathy can correct me if I got that wrong. And she's working on, she's worked on books with very famous people. She's helped to write songs. Um, and she is currently working on a children's book with Tanya Tucker. How exciting is that? So thank you, Kathy, for being here. Um, and Kevin St. Jar is also with us. Kevin has worked in the corporate world. He is a lot of students have of his previous students of his have come into our bookstore. Um, he's his teaching and consulting have taken him around the globe and he's a combat veteran. He is a journalist, a teacher, and has an MFA in creative writing from the Stone Coast MFA program. And uh, his first three novels were published by Berkeley Books. His latest novels, Absence of Grace, just released in April of 2022, The Twin Celestine and Aliens Drywall and a Unicycle have all been published by Encircle Publications. His essays and poetry have appeared in various publications and his pushcart nominated short fiction has appeared in journals such as Story and Solstice Literary Magazine. And he lives on the coast of Maine, but Kevin, for those of you that aren't familiar with him, um, comes from Madawaska. So we have some great representation in this book. And I am going to bring them up so they can talk to us more about their work. So let me see if I can get um, oh, sorry, Kathy. <laughs> I need to get Kathy up here. There we go. There, technical difficulties, but it's usually op it's operator problems. So now, uh, if you both can unmute yourselves. Hello, everybody. There we go. How Hi. are you? <laughs> so this is the book we're here to talk about tonight, Breaking Bread. And um, I'm so thrilled that both of you are here, as I've already said, and um, Kathy and Kevin join 70 
authors from New England. And I have to say that we have a really robust um, pool of talent in New England. So it's really great to have you guys part of that and, and here this evening to talk about this book. So Kathy, do you, could you tell us a little bit about um, the history of the making of this book? Do you, are you familiar with that? Uh, well, I am. I don't know if Deborah Joy is with us um, now or not, but um, my Hi, friend- I can see her, is, yes. She? Yes, she, um, she would be a good one to talk about it too. My friend, Deborah Joy Corey, um, having the lovely heart that she has, as well as an amazing writing ability, decided to grow vegetables and, and, and help um, a program she began called Blue Angel to help people who could use some good fresh food on their tables at night. And before long, people were leaving vegetables. Oh my God, there goes a cat. People were leaving vegetables. They just leaped uh, on her porch, baskets of all kinds of lovely things from their gardens, helping her out. And so it, it grew. And, and if she's here, she'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. But then she decided a book with asking writer friends and, and friends asking friends to write essays on food, their knowledge of food. Some people in the book are from the South. You know, some are from New York, some are like Kevin and me from Northern Maine. And uh, that would also help, uh, help help fill the coffers to help her project, help the uh, people who can use a hand. That's awesome. So how did the two of you come to participate as contributing authors to this, this project? Well, I can never hide from Deborah Joy for very long. <laughs> she always finds me and... Um, Anything she would want to do, I would want to do. And, and I think, Kevin, um, I said to her, I'm the only one from Northern Maine, per quoi. Um, <laughs> and also, ploys, come on, we've got to have some French Franco type <laughs> dishes in there. And I, I'm not Franco enough to represent that. And I can't make ploys, by the way, I flip them. Uh, so, Kevin? Yeah, I wrote this wonderful thing on ploys. I was so pleasantly surprised. I just received an email from Kathy out of the blue and she told me about the project and she said, uh, <clears throat> would you be interested in writing something on, on food? And that was nostalgic. She said, no, I think she said no recipes. Um, but she said uh, something that, you know, conjures up memories. And uh, I wrote back, how about ploys? And she wrote back, perfect. So, uh, uh, and I, I had been thinking about uh, writing something about ploys uh, anyway, because, you know, they, they're such a part of, of growing up in the in northern rustic they we need to find are. out later if anyone else flips them on here if i'm if i'm the only one you're the only one. Oh my god I, <laughs> well so my husband is a culinary person right and he that's the big thing they would always do this event at the university of maine at fort kent for the maple sugaring time and they bouchard ploys actually would come and make ploys but sometimes they'd have some of their chefs come to take over and you'd hear it all through the kitchen all day long. Don't flip the ploys. <laughs> but I'm guilty of doing it myself because I'm not always too uh, patient enough for it. So Kevin, you wrote about ploys. Kathy, you wrote about fiddleheads, which I thought was pretty special too. Um, what made you decide to write on fiddleheads? Well, you know, it's a very unique thing to northern, northern, um, the northern part of this country, not just our northern part, but across the United States. And uh, I just walked above my house here and picked some and had them last night for supper. That's how much they're a part of my, my life. And they, they represent, they're one of those foods like with Kevin's ploys, they represented his mother to him, fiddleheads and mama canning them and other things and fiddlehead season coming and my brother going to get them. It's just a big part of the nostalgia of being a child here. Mm. And um, I, I also thought it would be unique to write about fiddleheads. I knew nobody else would, let's put it that way. Well, that's not true. There are other people from small town Maine. Uh, I had dibs on it. I think I was the first <laughs> <laughs> Deborah will know that. Yes. She said uh, she there's so this evening there's other events for this book in other locations and she's leaving right now to be going oh. to uh, the print event down in Portland. And, oh, right. But she's going to continue to listen in, but she has full confidence in you and Kevin to tell us all about everything that we need to know. You drive uh, carefully. 
Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, Kevin, so one of the things that I thought was really wonderful about this book is it's it's a book with uh, a mission because proceeds from the sale of this book actually go to fund uh, Blue Angel. Uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? Are you familiar with that? Um, the My familiarity only goes as far as um, uh, from the get-go, they said, you know, we're going to um, um, seek out these, these stories, put them together, and then the proceeds would go to help uh, in that effort, uh, helping with people who are food insecure and uh, making sure that they're getting high quality um, farm to table uh, food. Uh, and I mean, that's, I mean, what could be better than that? So, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, so it sounds like uh, for people that are dealing with hunger on a daily basis, their access to uh, fresh produce may be lacking. And uh, it seems as though this is a wonderful effort to try to solve some of those issues. So that's yeah. The, I mean, the, if you look in a supermarket, typically the cheapest food is the most processed food, right? The the boxes of powdered cheese and yep. macaroni. And I'm not knocking those products, but costs more but, to uh, eat healthy. It, yeah, it really does. Yeah, it's expen it costs more to eat healthy. So, um, so um, I mean, it was such a good project, and and uh, and you just feel better, you know, if you get some fresh vegetables and stuff. You don't have to. Um, give your kids, um, you know, oodles and noodles every night. You can say, here's a fresh salad, you know. And, right. Um, so I, I think it's really worthwhile. That's terrific. There's some beautiful pictures on, um, Deborah often posts them on Facebook of the baskets of the, the vegetables that friends are leaving on her front porch. Oh. It's gorgeous, you know, to see that happening. Um, yeah, very nice. That is nice. One of the things um, that struck me, so first of all, both of your essays were just a joy for me to read because it was so nostalgic of my own upbringing and the type of uh, life and, and memories that I tried to make for my own children. Um, now that they've all moved away, they're still holding on to some of those things, asking for fiddleheads and for us to mm -hmm. ship them ploys. Um, so that's really kind of a neat thing to see. Um, but the thing that struck me about your pieces is that uh, your mothers played such an important role in, in this. And um, can you guys talk a little bit about how moms might affect the memories we have about food? Kevin? Sure. Um, I mean, nobody remembers an individual ploy, right? <clears throat> it's, a, it's about the people. It's about... Um, um, I mean, when I think of fiddleheads, and we ate fiddleheads so often in spring, but I don't remember a plate of fiddleheads. I remember the 80-year-old guy who showed up in the polyester pants, and he would knock on the door, and he'd say, you know, fougeade or whatever, and and we'd be like, mom, and then they'd buy a paper bag of fiddleheads, put it right in the freezer. Um, it was the same guys, the same old guys that would come around selling smelt later, you know, mm -hmm. um, these are all these stories about food are actually about people, and um, the same thing with ploys. Um, you know. How do you uh, say fiddleheads in French? <clears throat> Fougé. I hope I'm saying that right. I've been out of the valley a bit. It's uh, it's actually I think just the French word for firm. Um, uh, yeah. uh, but we always jokingly called it fougère, and so uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I actually have a, a student with the same last name. His last name is Fougé, and I was like. Do you know what that means? And he was far <laughs> less excited than I was. You know. <laughs> but uh, but stories about food are, are about the people uh, who are there and and um, you know the interaction with that food and um, and then missing it. You know, um, I lived for a number of years in Europe and didn't have a didn't have a ploy for years. And uh, when you come back, it's it's not just the food; it's the memories that come along with that food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think most of my essay is about the memory uh, of my mother and, and how time changes us all and how, like the fiddlehead, the generations are going to keep unfurling and keep happening. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. You don't remember one. I might remember one single ploy. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is about the whole picture of 
growing up here. And you know, here they were growing within a stone's throw of where I'm sitting right now above my spring here. So one of the family. That's great. I, um, my grandmother was a very poor woman and she had eight children and it was this time of the year was so busy because she was foraging for all before we really called it foraging. It was just time, yeah. time to pick dandelion, time to pick fiddleheads. But the thing that was so interesting about her is as poor as she was, um, there was always a welcome seat at the table and everybody always feasted because of this food that was just available um, mm -hmm. to, to them because yeah. we were forced labor at that time, right? <laughs> 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 Kevin, I don't know if you were ever put on uh, picking duty, but I know that I was, and it sounds like Kathy was from. Yeah. Know. I mean, and <clears throat> you talk about food insecurity. I mean, um, you can feed a lot of people for very little money with ploys, you know, mm -hmm. or fiddleheads. Or um, I was listening recently to one of those videos that uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Chasse had made, and an older woman, who I wish I could remember her name, was giving an account of her childhood. And at one point, he actually said, "What was it you went to the store for?" You know, and she'd say, "I think it was like a, a hundred pounds of flour for a dollar fifty or something like this." But um, it was fascinating that he actually had to go the other way what was it that you actually had to go to the store for and she was like salt you know that sort of thing um but she remembers all these all these foraging as you say right. before it was hip um yeah. they're picking dandelions and um Arms which in french table, is funny right? because they're called pee the bed right dandelions i mean um there's a story about dandelions i guess making you pee in the bed piss on really? is what i didn't know that yeah yeah and uh, it's not a very romantic name for a flower but kevin you don't think your parents just told you that you know that would be really embarrassing uh, 45 <laughs> 50 years it's <laughs> recounting that maybe somebody can back me up but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah so let me see okay just want to there okay well, I was also stunned by the other authors that are included in this, and um, and I've read some of the other essays, but I'm curious if the two of you have other favorite essays that you have enjoyed in this collection. I, I you know, Wesley McNair, the poet, is one of my dearest friends for many years, and uh, his poem, um, I, I, is it the rhubarb poem? I'm trying to remember. I, I just read yes. more of his poems the other day. Yeah, Wesley is, um, you know, just one of my favorite poets on earth, and he happens to be a friend. It helps. That was one. Um, I loved Susan Conley's. I loved Elizabeth Peavy's. Uh, Lee Smith, who was from the South. Lee is my, uh, my mentor. It was Lee Smith who said to me one day when I was writing poetry, and I took her class at Vanderbilt. I think it was 1982. And she read my short story and she said, and forgive me, Lee, she said, why don't you write a novel? <laughs> so um, I, I, I know, Lee says, um, I wrote The Funeral Makers because at least I thought Lee Smith said this, I better do this because I hadn't, I didn't really know any real writers. And so <clears throat> she's, her, her, everything Lee writes about the South and her parents and her family is just amazingly poignant and, and lyrical and poetic. So. Yeah, that was one of my very favorites. Kevin? Well, I went running for Kathy's. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, I mean, Lily King's piece is very good. Wes McNair, I, I went to grad school with his daughter. I, uh, Fook, uh, Tron's piece is very good. Um, what I like about these types of essays is and I don't know if it's just me, but I used to be able to sit and read a hundred pages in a sitting. Now I read till I fall asleep, which is about 10 minutes. And yeah. these things are awesome. I sit there and dig into one. And, and um, when I read Lily Kings, I actually, uh, I think I carried it right into dream space. Um, so it's, it's been a, a great collection to kind of uh, find my way through. And it's almost like a story per night as I work my way through. Um, you know, so something else. Uh, sorry, Kevin, you no, finished? Okay. No, go ahead, please. Um, 
Kevin is one of the ones who read his piece. And so I listened to Kevin's. I, I didn't actually sit down with the book and read it yet. I listened to him reading it on the Blue Angel website. Lee Smith is reading hers. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Hal Crowther, her, her husband, is reading his. And Kevin is one reading his. I'm going to do mine eventually. But you could go there to blueangel.com and hear some of the essays as well. And, uh, and still get the book because then that supports the cause. Absolutely. I, I was on um, uh, main calling this, this morning. And one of the things that came up is how, just to your point, Kevin, about um, people's attention span, it's since COVID booksellers have really noticed this, that um, it's taking people longer to read novels and so we've done a lot of encouraging of having them read some collections to get them back into reading because there's people that either they were sick or just from the isolation just fell out of that arena of reading. So yeah. this type of collection is just perfect for that because you get a yep. great story and um, and you're, you feel like you accomplish something every day. Yep. Right? <laughs> so. I'd love to see it in. I'd love to see it in every waiting room, right? From yeah. Madawaska to Kittery. That's a great idea. A, what a great book. If, Debra, if Deborah's listening to this, her ears just went, "Oh, <laughs> they unfurl like a fiddlehead." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she'd love that too. Uh, by the way, my essay is in Yankee Magazine. I'm very proud to say they chose mine, and so it's in this month. And Kevin's is soon to be in the forum. I don't yeah. know if Lisa Michelle was on here, the editor of the the, uh, the forum, the Franco-American um, newsletter. It's just a wonderful, wonderful collection of all things Franco. And Kevin's is going to be, I guess, in the next issue. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, the, <clears throat> Kathy's been like the connective tissue for me on this this whole project. And I, I'm just honored to be part of it. Um, um, well, I'm honored to have to have you be part of it. And we've never met in person, have we? We did, but uh, uh, you were. Um, oh, don't so tell me it was in a bar, please. No, no. <laughs> oh, I wish. Um, no, it was. Um, it was at a signing. I want to say probably in '96 or '97 in Fort oh. Kent, and I want to say it was. Oh. Uh, what would that have been? Uh, maybe um, sunny in '96, '97. Or running of the bulls, yeah. Who knows? Yeah, I know, right? So, uh, yeah, but yeah. I, I went up. I was actually working for the Valley Times, and uh, Julia Bailey oh, was my that's editor. Right. Julia Bailey was my editor. The amazing yeah. uh, Julia Bailey, and she she the says, "Wonderful Julia." Oh yeah, and uh, so you signed you signed my book. I was like, I'm getting paid for this. This is awesome. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know if this has happened to you yet, but do you see ones come up for sale on Amazon? It's someone used my dear friend. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for supporting my work. And it's now for sale on uh, used yeah. books on Amazon or somewhere. Yeah. yeah, I had someone, I had a friend um, named Tom write to me and said, I've got a copy of your book and it's signed. And I said, really? And he says, yeah, it says, dear Louise. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So, well, um, Kathy, I pick up those the candles on Bay Street every time I see them because I like giving them to people. So mm -hmm. if I see them at a like a used bookstore, that's what I do. Is I that's where if I you buy see them. one signed to Alicia Silverstone, keep it. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't exist. I was just kidding. Yeah. No, I, I like looking at old books that are on there that say autographed because you think, mm -hmm. oh, well, I wonder if it's like Einstein wrote his name to someone. So that's fun to go as a detective and see if he right. finds some little gem. But thank God I'm not that old yet I, for our autographs to be that ancient that they're worth something. <laughs> so um, I do wanna get back to talking about this a little bit, but I think it's also worthy to talk about the projects that each of you are working on um, individually. Um, Kevin, I've, I've had a lot, I just had a student of yours come in today that had no idea that you have these books that have been published and was really excited to hear about that. And um, so can you tell me a little bit of where they sit with the genre and what inspires you? 
I drive my publisher crazy because I keep jumping genres. Um, and he, he keeps asking, how do we market you? And uh, I'm not a genre. So um, I have a literary fiction. Um, I write the story that I need to write. So like Aliens, Drywall, and Unicycle is about, they're all somewhat about learning to look uh, at yourself, look inward, um, and do some growing. So Aliens is about a, a small town newspaper reporter um, and he thinks he's all that in a bag of chips and he feels superior to all his neighbors and and he starts to look through their their lenses and learn something about himself. Um, Celestine, I took a um, someone who was a, a young girl in 1984, ninth grader in 1984 and dropped her in 2022 so we could have a look at ourselves. Um, um, the twin is uh, a look at the story of Jesus of Nazareth from the point of view of, of Thomas, uh, the, the Apostle Thomas. And then uh, Absence of Grace is um, trying to understand where wh why people do bad things to other people. Um, so, <clears throat> But if you looked at, at where a bookstore owner might put them, they might go literary fiction, YA, uh, historical fiction, thriller, um, so, uh, so I get my inspiration just, um, I mean, like Stephen King had talked about the what if questions. Um, sometimes there's a what if question, like absence of grace. What if there was something horrible that happened, you're traumatized, so you would draw, and so then you're re-traumatized, and then so then you really would draw, and you have nowhere else to go, and you're re-traumatized. Like, what would a person do um, that didn't completely come apart? And uh, instead of fight, he goes for fight, and he goes on this on this quest. Um, so it's it's usually a what if question that that's driving it. Mm -hmm. uh, Book of Emmaus is an, is just a, a mystery uh, built a, in three different time, um, three different times in the same monastery in Prague. I love Prague. I've spent quite a bit of time there. Um, the monastery has been there since the 1300s. I thought it was a good place to set a story, and um, the one I'm working on now is about a small town where out-of-staters move there because it's absolutely perfect. And as soon as they get there, they get busy changing it. Um, so I want to explore that Sounds sort of- a little nonfiction to me, but- Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, take it, uh, I take it quite a bit further um, into absurdism where, you know, we're going to end up with uh, searchlights and, and the barbed wire and that sort of thing, but uh, having fun with it. That's good. And Kathy? Um, forthcoming, you, you, I, I've spent two years writing. Why I left fiction, I don't know, because the, the, the genres are vastly different, fiction and nonfiction. Even how I hold my body, I've discovered my neck, my hands is different for fiction than nonfiction. That's an astonishing thing I didn't realize. Um, I go so deep into fiction because I'm creating those characters and they're talking to me that I'll sometimes think, well, what time is it? What, it? And I realize I can't move my neck and my hands and I look out and, you know, seven hours have passed. I'm always aware of where I am with nonfiction. Uh, but it's, God, it's hard. Stuart O'Neill said to me, I'm not doing that anymore. It's too damn hard. <laughs> it's, it's true. There's so much research. And I didn't know that as a fiction writer. Fiction writers, literary writers are kind of snobs when it comes to that sort of thing, right? Poets are the biggest snobs. And then, and then you, have, uh, you have the literary novelist who thinks, oh, nonfiction is it's lovely and it's wonderful and I respect it, but you know, it's nonfiction. Well, I changed my mind. It, it's very tough. So I spent two years writing um, why I don't know, but I, I'm i like Kevin, I, I challenge myself. I, I don't wanna be in one suitcase and I call it the creative sandbox and I wanna play in all the corners and all over the sandbox. Uh, so this was the 1952 Northeaster that hit um, New England and, and, and Maine. It wasn't a bad one compared to how Northeasters run, um, but I, read about a couple of incidents, you know, in that memories from Bath and memories from Brunswick and memories from things you see online. I happened to see a couple of incidents of the snow in uh, Bath and something that had happened, a woman pregnant and needing to get to the hospital. And I thought, I wonder, and it lay dormant uh, for, I, I think since 2004. And um, I came off of the Einstein book, which damn near killed me. And I want to make a record of that right now if I die it's because of that book I want someone to do something about that uh, <clears throat> I thought never again and Tom and I came home from 
a uh, book signing I had for Proving Einstein Right, the book I'm talking about with that amazing physicist. I do it all over again with him. He's wonderful. Uh, and said to Tom, will you go in the basement and see if you can find this packet that says Snowstorm 1952. It's full of newspaper clippings that libraries sent me. And about 20 minutes later, he was back and threw it down and I started, I started writing on it. And so I, I'm just finishing the final polish. <clears throat> you know, we lie to ourselves about a book being finished. We say, oh, it's done, it's done. And of course it, it isn't. We just, it's the year of corn in front of the donkey is what it is. And I remember one time having a book party, it's finished. I sent, um, it's a book, cards out, you know, those birth cards, instead of it's a boy, I, cool. changed, I changed it into it's a book and it weighs like one pound something. I had the manuscript like that. Well, we had this great party for my finishing the book. And then I got up the next morning and tore the ending all apart and started writing again. So it's coming in January and um, we'll see, we'll see. Let me just say this, New York, Thank you, New York. New York sent back uh, the first cover and it had Portland Head Lighthouse on it, kind of tilting because it was a storm. And of course, I don't know much about lighthouses, but this book, talk about a challenge. I mean, I had to ask questions like, what is the difference between a dock, a wharf and a pier? Like when you say that, what does that mean? Uh, I know nothing about the ocean and part of my story is about the ocean. Um, so they sent back a lighthouse, although there's only 22 pages in the book of ocean and no mention of a lighthouse. So they took that off and then put other stuff. And now we got a cover that I'm going to live with. But um, that's another thing, right, Kevin, that we have to go through is dealing with copy editors and dealing with uh, publicists and dealing with how we're marketing this. And as he said, a bookstore wants to know and, and publisher wants to know where does this go in the store? Barnes and Noble want to know where does it go in the store? Where are we going to put that? What shelf? And like Kevin, I'm on a lot of shelves. I don't want to be on just one shelf. So, okay, I'm done. I have been alone for a month. I haven't talked this much. And, you're, you know, it's, it's, this is uh, great. This that is was great. Fantastic. <laughs> and it, it actually segues into my next question is that you talked a little bit, Kathy, about your writing process. And it is, it's always been something that I've been aware of is the research that authors put into the work that they're doing, even with fiction, sometimes even more with fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and even uh, more with nonfiction. Yeah, I'm sure. And yeah. um, but I'm I'm curious if your process of writing changes when you're doing an essay. And I know it's a smaller piece, but I'm just wondering how when you come to to the to the table to write any work does it change depending on what it is that you're writing well are you talking is that for me that's um, for both of you but both of go us ahead. go ahead uh, it, it certainly does for me and uh it depends on what it is like in the fiddlehead essay there was a moment where i really got into the the emotion of the piece because i'm talking about my mother dying and and how no fiddleheads from her each year is going to mean something so that's very emotional the way you might dealing with the character that you've created that same kind of emotion um, uh, I know that I'm in a different place in my head when I write nonfiction compared to fiction. Let me tell you something, and Kevin can answer that uh, and see if you bring something new to it. But one thing that I really notice the difference is if I happen to write a long piece in present tense or in uh, first person, and then try to switch back to oh. omniscient narrator in third person and try to go back and forth, that's, that's very difficult. That was yeah. very difficult. <clears throat> I totally agree. And switching POV is really hard. Um, mm -hmm. I think writing in first person is hard uh, just because you have to keep limiting yourself. Um, but I I would say with the research to a smaller piece um, in my in an essay, like don't flip the ploys, um, there's no there was no research at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and even the book Aliens, uh, Drowdle and Unicycle, is virtually no research um, because it's almost like a it's not quite stream of consciousness, but it's it's feelings and human interaction and that sort yeah. of thing. But the twin was stuff you was, already know. Yeah, yeah, that you already know. And the twin um, is historical fiction, and it's about three years of research. And um, and it, and when it's like it was like pulling a thread on a sweater. Every time I found something new, I go what, and I look for the basis of that. And and uh, yeah. So you end up falling down these wells and Kathy was talking about like her neck would hurt or whatever. I, I would be writing and I'd look up and it had gone dark outside. Um, 
and uh, that that sort of thing. Uh, so you wonder what season it is sometimes, you don't know, <laughs> right? You don't know like, what the hell is it winter? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so less research uh, with something like a, an essay like that because it's. Uh, I mean that that essay is is um, a big chunk of it is portraying what a, a smart ass my mother was. I mean she was funny and feisty and and opinionated and uh, so cool and so um, so that's what I'm trying to convey there. I mean, you know, do I really know if it's better to put cold water than hot water in play mix? Like scientifically, I haven't tested it, but but mom said ice cold, so it's it's ice cold as far as I'm concerned. And that's, that's kind of what I was trying to get across, like how sure she was of these things, you know, uh, just because great aunt Priscilla had told her that, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> so I, I, that was the fun of it. And she made them a lot of times. She did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't have a lot of money either. You know, there was quite a few times when I was very little that supper was boiled macaroni and a squirt of ketchup on each plate. And that was supper, you know, so Ploys were a thing, and uh, if you had cretonne, beans, or that, I mean, there's not that many times when I was a kid that you're kind of holding your stomach on the floor going, I'm full, I'm full, the ploys would do it. And that's amazing to hear you say that, you know, I mean, uh, we had rough times too, but to hear you say that, Kevin, that makes this book even more, even more valuable, and this whole project that Deborah's doing with Blue Angel really drives it home how this happens to people you know if it can happen to you yeah uh, in your childhood yeah i i agree i think that's a really great point and it, i think it's just something i think the other thing that's interesting i i i have covid on my mind right now only because i've been talking a lot about it lately but there's been some really interesting conversations uh, with people of like suddenly having this step back, like people that never have had shortages of food, all of a sudden going to the grocery store and seeing like entire shelves empty and like having these panic attacks. And then you had people that were starting to hoard food, you know, and it's just interesting how some event like this can impact so, so much. Uh, before I continue talking, I want to ask anybody that's watching this evening, if you have questions for Kathy or Kevin, um, we'd love to hear from you. That's part of the time we have allotted is to answer some questions. Um, I think we have a few aspiring authors actually that might be joining us this evening. So if there's any time, anything that you want to know, this is your time to ask it. And you just have to type in the chat or get my attention by doing jumping jacks or something up top. <laughs> so just let us know. Um, so what- We don't know who's here. So I, I, I would okay. ask somebody a question if I knew who was here. Well, yeah, we have, um, well, Deb is still on. We have a lot of people from the community that are here right now. Uh, Mona Bouchard, do you know Mona Bouchard? Mona. Mom is I on. just got at the hummingbirds, Mona. <laughs> and um, and we just I just let a couple of people just in right now that just joined us. Just want to make sure. Hi, okay. Mona. Um, so the other thing that was interesting, and I wondered if you might know the answer to this, is this book is divided into five parts. Do you know any? anything about the decisions for that i don't i don't we i maybe deborah will be back later for something but i i don't sorry that's okay i don't either i was actually i was surprised um when i saw it set up that way and then i was like oh who's in my section and it was like so many yeah. cool people i was like yeah. <laughs> but my as a reader when i was looking at it i wondered if you were assigned like this is type the the overarching, but that's not what happened. You wrote your I wasn't. and then it was. I don't know if that ended up happening as they got more, as they gathered more essays that they saw, they started falling into demarc demarcations mm -hmm. between them. I but I I wasn't. Kevin and I needed we we had to do we knew we had to do fiddleheads and floors. Yes. It's just yeah. just natural. Well, I think it's so nice for. 
I, before we got on this evening, there was a conversation that Allagash never um, puts what itself into the idea of the St. John Valley or Arosta County even. Well, I have posted this before and asked people, I know I have never said I'm from the county. I have never said I'm from the St. John Valley. I have always said I am from Allagash, you know, like you do with Elvis or Cher. Um, <laughs> I, I never did. And I think that people in the post said the same thing. Um, it's been a few years since I posted that asking, am I the only one or do other guys in town do that too? Uh, is, if there's anybody here from Malagash, they might be able to, to, to say something about that. But no, I, I don't know why. I, I think it's because we grew up very isolated. I mean, even I, I was the, the, the town kid, the, the farm kid, you know, I mean, there's a little clutch of buildings that's Allagash the town where the school is and there was a little store there. Then you cross the bridge and there's another little clutch of buildings that was Dickey and there's another bridge and a store. I was five miles from that, you know? So um, in the summer, I didn't even see kids from school. Hmm. I didn't see the kids I went to school with. I saw the, the kids that lived, a couple of kids lived locally. So it was a very lonely childhood in many ways because of that. My sister Joan said to me one time, she read this uh, part of a memoir thing I started again for Deborah Joy. And she said to me, I didn't realize how lonely you were as a kid, mm -hmm. but it's that part of loneliness that comes with being a writer, isn't it, Kevin? It's that, it's that idea of feeling that you are somewhat of an outsider, not just geographically, not just within the family because they had five kids and then they had me almost six years later. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's why I felt that I was from Allagash. There was no, I didn't get out enough to see that I was part of a larger a larger uh, plate called the St. John Valley or the county. Yeah, yeah so. I, I wasn't I wasn't as isolated. I lived, uh, I grew up um, kind of right up the, the hill from McDonald's in Madawaska. So it's kind of in the middle of Madawaska. But God, how but, old are you? There was a McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, I'll be 54 this summer. We, but we I, had a buckboard probably, not a McDonald's. <laughs> no buckboard, I'm kidding. Um, so yeah, you were you were a city boy in, in a way. Well, the nice thing about Madawaska then was it seemed like um, I could step out of my, my backyard into the largest forest in the contiguous 48 states. You know, I mean, there was a brook right there and uh, we lived at the last house of that street and, and uh, we spent all our time in the woods. I mean, my dad would go into the mill and he'd be still eating his cereal when we'd take off into the woods and then the steam whistle would blow at 4 p.m. and we'd we'd head home um, uh, and the whole neighborhood would go. Uh, back then, Madawaska was a town of young families. Um, so, uh, and Fort Kent to me was where I went to get stitches and see the eye doctor, that was it. Uh, so- Fort Kent um, was Oz to me, it was Oz. It was Oz, right? Yeah. Was yeah. yeah. Kevin, what year are you talking about when, when you're talking about? You talking when, about I was a, when I was a kid like that, I'm talking like uh, 74, 75, probably. Um, and those, I mean, and it's different. You know, I tell people this a lot. If you grew up up there and you grew up in the 70s, you shouldn't be thinking like Saturday Night Fever. You should think more like Stand By Me. Like, like our dads all cut our hair with clippers and we, you know, we all look like the boys in Stand By Me in the middle 70s. We weren't, we, we didn't have shoulder length hair and stuff like this. And um, I mean, I'm sure there were Madawaska kids had long hair, but but that wasn't us. We were just, um, our hair was all bleached in the sun. Our skin was all dark from the sun and we had scrapes and bruises all over us. And we spent the time in the brooks and the woods and I was, you know, playing pickup sports. So, um, but it wasn't like today where you couldn't play without a minivan and a referee. You know, I mean, you, you just picked up a game and you played and it felt, it looks more like what people portray, like the, like Stand By Me, the 50s. Uh, it was a simpler, it was a simpler place. I remember when I moved back to the St. John Valley from, from away um, in 2005, I had a seven year old, eight year old, and uh, we didn't let him leave the lawn. We were like, oh my gosh, you know, someone might take him. And, and it took a while before, you know, I'm driving down Fox Street in Madawaska and there's three little kids on their bikes and probably two miles from home and it's okay, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's a very different sort of, feel um i think um so yeah uh, but i we weren't i wasn't lonely 
um, I don't feel lonely being alone. And like Kathy's saying, writing is a is a solo adventure. Um, I can be alone, and in fact, I pay good money to be alone sometimes. Um, but um, but uh, as a kid, there was always there was always plenty of kids around, uh, one street after the next. Back then, a lot yeah. of changes. There, yeah. there is a lot of changes. I had a similar experience though when we were when I was growing up. Um, it's just wild. And then, um, and I lived on Market Street, so I was in the the, the thick of things, you know. And um, uh, I moved away, had some kids, moved back to raise them. And when we were living in Portland, my goodness, you couldn't let them be five inches away from you. And what a challenging thing to just let them be free. And but what a great childhood they ended up having, you know, by, yeah. by moving back here. It was terrific. I have a question that came in from Sheila Jans and her her um, Sheila. her video is not on, so I'll ask it for her. And she simply wants to know what brings you joy? When Sheila visits. <laughs> <laughs> my, my guest room is still waiting for her. She's my favorite, one of my very favorite guests. Um, you know, there's that old joke that there are writers who love to write and there are writers who love that they've written. And I know that the love that they've written is supposed to be, you know, derogatory in a way, but that's what I love. I love that I've written. What brings me that I've got something I can pick up and think, my God, this was just an idea in my head one day. Hmm. And now, you know, now it's on Heidi's, Heidi's shelf back there. And it was just an idea that still floors me. I, I'm, I'm stunned at that. Um, but really this river and those hummingbirds that are swarming those feeders right now and the bumblebee I took a picture of yesterday and the snake I, I'll find in this summer and the squirrel and nature, nature will save me. And when I realized that nature was going to save me, I thought, you know, I think I could probably do the rest of my life. It's going to be okay. Mm. I really enjoy being alive. I enjoy just being, just getting up in the morning and having a cup of coffee and saying, man, I'm so lucky. And there's so many people, I'm not in Ukraine. There's so many people who are ill and, and unhealthy and, and depressed and sad and needing things on their table at night that aren't there. And here I am throwing away food to the crows and the raccoons and the... So Sheila, and then when you come back again, I'll be happier. <laughs> How about you, Kevin? It's a tough answer to follow. Um... I, I enjoy nature. I enjoy getting into that the bigger spaces. Um, I, my writing um, writing brings me joy, um, especially very early in the morning. Well, I like to get outside five thirty in the morning, cup of coffee, and and write. And uh, I it centers me. Uh, fishing centers me. Um, those kind of simple things. I think that um, um, when I was a kid, I was chasing money and I've gotten just old enough now that I realize I'm chasing time. Mm -hmm. um, and I gladly trade money for time. Um, uh, you know, I used to actually, when I was younger, um, I used to actually hate to sleep because I was losing time. Um, and so, um, so it's, it's, you know, that's, I'm always looking for the, the, the time to be centered, to be quiet, um, and, uh, and, and to create stuff, whether it's visual art or writing or whatever. Can I add something to that? Um, you're talking about um, time running out. That's now something I realize that, not, that I'm not the only writer who now thinks of this. I think in terms of how many more books am I gonna be able to write? Therefore, because two years per book, three years per book, I'm 69 years old. How many more books? How many, I've got several half done right now. So now I'm kind of like looking at what's gonna happen in the next 15 years, 20 years, if I'm lucky enough to be healthy and writing, um, I'm gonna to have to start making choices and say, okay, I'm not gonna be able to do this because I wanna do a couple more big nonfiction books. That's, that's probably six years of my life right there. Mm -hmm. So now I'm thinking in terms of time as in how many books am I gonna be able to write? I never thought that way before, you know, ever. 
that's never even occurred to me. That's so interesting. That shows you what matters to you. Yeah. Yeah, that really gives voice, I think, to, I think you said it perfectly, there's so many writers, I've got so many stories in my head. And so, um, and I think a bunch of us have half finished books and I- Who's gonna put, find those on our computer, Kevin? Yeah, Nobody's right. gonna find those. Nobody's gonna find them. <laughs> yeah. um, I've put books away just because they're, oh, this is too sad to write. And, and you know what I mean? But I'm like, well, that was a good story. I think the first time I considered that concept, when I was too young to get it, was Keats, right? And he was talking about like, you know, will he have time to get everything um, out of his brain onto, onto the page? And, uh, and he didn't have much time, right? He died in his 20s. 26 so, or something, 24? Yeah, so, um, so it's, <clears throat> it's, it's a real thing. And, um, and sometimes, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not someone who is given to sort of anxiety or panic, but there are times when I go, oh, why am I doing this when I could be doing that, you know? Um, I love where I'm working and living right now, and uh, but it's the longest I've worked or lived anywhere uh, since I was 17, about my about five or six years. And um, I, Deborah Markport was a professor of mine, and she had a phrase called "detonate your life." Uh, so about every six, five, six years, I've detonated my life and and started over with something else. I'm I'm on year eight here. I love it. Um, I'm hoping to teach out my teaching career here, but. Uh, um, but honestly, there is kind of this thing in the back of your head. And, and sometimes, I'm sorry to go on so long, but sometimes people that don't write will say something like, well, you got 10 minutes, go write something. It's like, man, I can't even get the thing in gear in 30 minutes. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, everybody on here listing has those same concerns, just not with yeah. books. Yeah. You know, they're yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. of, do I keep working this job or do I stop and enjoy my life doing this? Do I go to Europe and live? Do I raise right. my grandchildren, uh, go stay near them. We all have those same concerns about time. Ours just happens to be about books. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, my maternal grandmother died at 29. So who knows, you know, like, wow. you know what I mean? Like who knows <clears throat> how much time we have. Um, and then you see like someone like George Burns, right? Um, <laughs> right? But the thing that we're really getting to is that it takes a long time to write one book. Yes. So it's a big decision because you're going to live with it a lot of a lot of time. And now that I'm into research, my God, you know, I'm I'm I, everywhere I look. There's a rabbit hole. I can't look up. I can't look up something about a jewelry store before I know it. I in 1952. Before I know it, I'm trying to find out more about the woman the woman who married the man who owned the jewelry store, whose son robbed a bank, and Thompson. Oh, I got to find out about him. And I'm gone for a whole day, and mostly. I, I have more stuff taken out of this Northeaster book of mine that's coming. I have more stuff that I have taken out of my research than I have in the book. There's just no doubt in my mind that that's going to end up being that way because I was wearing my research on my sleeve and you can't do that. You know, you get so excited and you want to say to people, hey, look what I found, you know, and they know it. A smart reader knows that. They think, yeah. oh, come on, put your research away. Uh, so I had to I had to do that. And that's something new for a fiction writer because I've been a fiction writer, you know, most of my life. Um, yeah. I think this has been great. I'm so grateful again for the both of you to, to do this this evening. It's I've learned a lot more about each of you. I think that's been a really tr nice treat for everybody that's been listening. Um, I want to remind everybody that we actually have a book signing this Saturday with Kevin and Kathy. Uh, that's at 3.30, and it's a very casual event. You can come in and have some time to chat if, if it's, you know, if there's space. And uh, we'll have plenty of these wonderful books, Breaking Bread, available for purchase on Saturday that Kathy and Kevin will sign. And we also have uh, several of their books each uh, available as well. So we hope you come over and um, give them a good hello and thank you for all the great work that they've been doing and such a wonderful thing for um, wherever you're from, the Valley or the County or the Allagash or Madawaska to just be proud of, of the work that you guys are doing. This is something that all of us are, are proud of to, to know that you're here and uh, you represent us all very well. So thank you for, for all of that. And may I say, this woman opened a bookstore. 
bookstore, <laughs> never mind COVID. She opened it before COVID. One of the most daring things you can possibly do. And if you remember, we didn't have one north of Bangor. You know, it was just so embarrassing to, to tell people that. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to know there's another one also, or a couple more uh, now. Um, but Heidi, thank you for what you do for books. I mean, what would we do? Yeah, well, I appreciate Nowhere that. Nowhere to put our babies. <laughs> I, I was just joking the other evening of how funny this whole book selling process has been um, during COVID, but especially when we were shut down, because uh, people were legally able to go buy pot wherever they wanted in the state of Maine, but they had to meet me in a dark alley to get a book. So <laughs> I started being called under under wraps, the shady book lady. So um, I'm glad that part's over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, Kathy Ryu, we have a lot of people saying thank you for the evening. Uh, Kathy Ryu, enjoy the evening, Kathy and Kevin, Valerie Black. Thank you, guys. Thank you. My students are always excited that an author they read also publishes for adults, makes them feel good. Um, the summer experiment, Kathy, is really popular with, with the kids here. Okay, um, great. I love talking to those kids. Yep. And, um, and then Mona Bouchard, of course, says thank you to both of you. And Sheila loved your responses to her question. So anyway, thank you. Is my husband on here, Heidi? Is my husband is. on here? Do you want him to bring yes. home some bread? Or I want him to come and do the yard because it's a mess. So please <laughs> come back to Maine and do the yard. He's in Montreal, near Montreal. Thank you, everybody, for coming and, and sitting in to do this. And hope we see you Saturday. And it means a lot to us. It really it means a lot that anybody takes time to listen to stuff we made up. Not even true, most of it. Well, anyway, <laughs> thank you, Heidi. Thank, thank you, Heidi. Thank you, everybody. Yes, see you Saturday. Yes.